Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Tomorrow, according to tradition, families across the country will gather around a table set with the usual fare of turkeys, potatoes, green beans, pumpkin pie, and whatever other secret family recipes that become associated with Thanksgiving Day. Or at least they'll gather around the items from Melissa could actually afford in the store this year. Now, I don't think I've ever actually done this with my family or in my lifetime, but in all of the special Thanksgiving episodes I've seen on TV, at some point in the meal, somebody chimes in with, I think we should go around the table and say what we're thankful for this year. It happens in every special, yet they always seem to think like they're the first ones to ever think of the idea. I don't know. But then, you know, then the, the camera pans around and everyone gets their moment. They get the usual litany, you know, I'm thankful for my family, my job, my kids, etc. We all get the warm and fuzzy feelings that this is a nice, cozy holiday tradition on this special day set apart to give thanks to God for all the blessings in our life. Now, if I'm being completely honest, it's a little awkward having a special church service for the holiday. Now, on the one hand, yes, we do recognize the Christian life should be one of thankfulness. And while our National Day of Thanks was given to us by President Lincoln rather than St. Paul, he did advocate for Christian devotion as the foundational reason, saying in his proclamation, No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed fit to me and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. On the other hand, however, Thanksgiving is an American holiday, not a church holiday. Yes, even though there are similar holidays observed in the Bible with harvest festivals and Thanksgiving offerings that were made by Israel in the Old Testament, when the readings for the day get assigned, they can't simply flip to the Thanksgiving part of the Bible and pull the scriptures out of there like we can with Christmas or Easter or Transfiguration Sunday. And so our lectionary committee gives us this reading from Luke's gospel. Already it's a bit of an odd gospel lesson for us. It's almost entirely narrative. Jesus isn't directly answering questions. He's not giving teachings, clearly delineating long gospel points that make it easy for me to write a sermon on it. His words are rather few. Instead, Luke is describing an event where Jesus encounters ten lepers on his journey, and they cry out to him for mercy. And being the merciful God that he is, he grants it to them, telling them to go and show themselves to the priests, which is a necessary part of the Mosaic law. If you're a leper, you can't be reintegrated into society until a priest has declared you to be clean. And then after they are healed, one of them comes back to Jesus, giving him thanks, and as pleased as Jesus is that this one is giving him thanks, he's rather annoyed with the rest of the group. We're not ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And the interpretation and application seem to be clear and straightforward. The other nine lepers just weren't thankful enough. Shame on them. This Samaritan, this dirty outcast among a group of diseased outcasts, was the only one to say thank you, and so proved to be greater than the other nine, presumably Jewish, other lepers. So be like him. Be like that one Samaritan. Make sure you say your thank yous around the table tomorrow. That warm, tender, made-for-TV moment is actually a statement of law that you have to make sure you do so Jesus doesn't get upset with you like he did with those other nine. So now that we're clear on that, you know, go and enjoy your turkey. Maybe you're starting to see why all the blogs and articles I read for sermon prep are a little upset that this is the appointed reading for Thanksgiving. But maybe if we dig a little bit deeper, we can get a better understanding of what lesson we might glean from this text. So we'll take this again from the top. Jesus is met by the ten lepers who are maintaining their distance. You know, social distancing was still a thing, even back then, for those with the plague. But if you read the law of Leviticus, the lepers are supposed to be shouting out, unclean, unclean, as a way to warn people from coming near and catching the disease themselves. 
These lepers, however, cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Technically, they're breaking the law here, but they're doing it in a confession of faith in Jesus. Somehow or another, they have heard of this traveling rabbi who performs miracles, and they acknowledge his lordship, and they ask for his blessing, knowing that if anyone can help them, it's Jesus. And take note, they all made this confession, all ten of them, so let's not get too hasty in saying the Samaritan is the only good one and the other nine are bad. Their faith is shown again in the very next sentence, because if you'll notice, Jesus does not immediately heal them like he does in other healing miracles of the Gospels. Rather, he just tells them, go and present yourselves to the priest. The implication seems to be that even though they are not yet healed, they will be by the time they arrive at the synagogue. And sure enough, they don't sit there and argue with Jesus. They just take him at his word that they ought to present themselves to the priests, and they begin their journey. Really, all ten are shaping up to be some pretty good examples of faithfulness, trusting in God's promise, even if they aren't seeing the results right away. Good for them. And sure enough, their faith does prove to be well-placed. We are told that as they went, they were cleansed. As they are making their way, this miraculous healing happens on their travel. And now is where the text gets interesting. We are told that upon this discovery, one of them does turn back, praising God, seeking to thank Jesus for what he has done. A marvelous example of the leper's faith that he still trusts that it was Christ who did this work and goes back to thank him. But what of the other nine at this point? The very simplistic reading I gave, the one I think we all have as we look at this text, makes us think that they just kind of wandered off and went back to their everyday lives and they didn't think too much about what happened. But if you really think about it, I don't think that's likely. In fact, I would wager that they continued on with Jesus' instructions. They did what they were told and they went to present themselves to the priests. And then there they were declared to be clean, they were allowed to re-enter society, and I expect that they were thankful for that. Leprosy was a serious illness that made you an exile until it killed you. To be healed of it was rare and miraculous in the days before antibiotics. These men were given a whole new lease on life. You can't tell me that they didn't shout out, thanks be to God, in response to hearing they were cleansed and welcomed back to life in their villages by the priests. So I think really this reading is about more than just making sure you say thank you to the blessings in your life or making sure you list all of the things you are thankful for when you gather around your turkey tomorrow. I think it's about the actual nature of thankfulness and how we approach it as a Christian instead of as a pagan. What does that mean? See, to be thankful is an interesting state to be in because you can't just be thankful for something. You have to be thankful to something as well. I can't just be thankful that I'll have a delicious turkey sitting in front of me tomorrow without also thanking Kitty for preparing it, because we're going to the Reaps this year. When it's presented in those Thanksgiving episodes of TV shows around the table, the characters always just say what they're thankful for. They're just speaking it out into the universe, whatever metaphysical force might be out there to hear it, they're thankful to that, I guess. They have a sense of gratitude, and good for them, but they're missing a direct object of their thanks. That's what I think the issue is for those other nine lepers. I'm sure they were thankful to be cured. They probably thanked God for the cure, but they lost sight of who God actually is. They probably said thanks be to God as that strange force somewhere in the heavens that's maybe watching us and generally wants us to be happy. But they lost sight of the God who loved creation so much he became incarnate to dwell among us. They had a shallow thankfulness that focused on what was given more than who the giver was. So the Samaritan is noteworthy not because he was the only one to say thank you, but because he was the only one to recognize the one to whom he should be saying thank you. The difference between Christian thankfulness and pagan thankfulness is that we know the one to whom we should be thankful, not just the things we are thankful for. The pagan only thinks about what has been given without caring about the giver, but our focus should always be on the giver himself. And so this year for Thanksgiving, I want to lay before you the challenge of Job. In chapter 2, after his fields have been destroyed and his children killed, Job's wife confronts him and says, Do you still hold fast to your integrity, curse God, and die? Bea's response is not to bemoan his hardships or wish for better things than what he's been experiencing lately, at least 
not this point in the narrative. Instead, in Job's wisdom, he says, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And admittedly, Job does go on and go through doubts throughout the rest of the book. But here in the beginning, he is recognizing true thankfulness is not about what you receive. It's entirely about who you receive it from, who is the one who gives it. So the challenge is to recognize that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. To recognize that everything, good and bad, that we receive in this life is handed to us by hands that bear the scars of nails of the cross. The challenge is that we not be so shallow to only be thankful for our possessions, our food, our clothes. You know, By all means, be thankful for them. But above all, let us make sure that we are being thankful to God as the one who provides you with everything. But on top of that, I also challenge you to thank him for the lessons you have learned through, through the hardships of your life. Thank him for the greater appreciation you have for what you now have after going without. Maybe even be so bold to thank him that you are going without right now because you know it will make you more grateful in the future. Our challenge this year is to have the faith of Paul, who even as he is languishing in prison, writes, I have learned in whatever situation I am, to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Give thanks to God that he died to restore his relationship with you, so that you will one day be restored as surely as the lepers were in our reading tonight. And then trust that your faith has made you well. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life of us. Amen. Amen.